Time for the only radio show of its kind. Auctioneers of antiques, collectors of cool, veterans of vintage. It's the Donnelly Auctions Hour on AM560, The Answer. For the next hour, enjoy great information about buying and selling antiques and collectibles and some interesting stories. Now, the Donnelly Auctions Hour. Welcome to the Donnelly Auctions Hour on AM560, The Answer. We're here every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. discussing our upcoming auctions, educating you with fun trivia, and interviewing people about collecting that we hope you will find interesting. I'm Mike Donnelly, your host today, and Randy and Susan are off this week getting a little well-deserved R&R. They'll be back next week, so today you'll have to put up with just me. Uh, Talk about our upcoming auctions. Uh, Actually, we're just a couple days away from our big phonograph and music box auction. Uh, It's going to be Wednesday, June 12th and 13th, uh, which is a Wednesday and Thursday. Now, that's a little unusual for us to have a a weekday auction, but we do it in conjunction with the big phonograph and music box show that is coming up uh, June 15th and 16th. That's on a Saturday and Sunday at the Schomburg Hyatt. Uh, It's the largest phonograph and music box show in the world, actually. It's been going on for 45 years now. And it's well worth attending if you've never been around a a lot of enthusiasts for phonographs and music boxes. It's a breed of their own, and uh, they're very enthusiastic about it. They'll they'll tell you everything you want to know and don't want to know about phonographs and music boxes. But it it really, for entering the hobby and just getting your feet wet in, is, is a very good place to go. So we have our auction on Wednesday and Thursday, which is just a few days before uh, the show, because if everybody's in town. I mean, this is a, a worldwide show, uh, attracts a worldwide audience. So everybody's in town for the show. So we host our Phonograph and Music Box auction. It's a two-day event. One day is uh, phonographs and music boxes, uh, and one day is radios and parts. We also do a lot of radios on there, too. Uh, we don't uh, have a lot of records. People always ask us about records, the value of records. Uh, we don't have a lot of records in the auction just because of the fact that that's uh, almost an animal unto itself. Uh, we have specific record auctions. So if you have collections of 78s and 45 RPMs, you can contact us, and we'll, we'll have specific auctions just for that. So th- this auction, we, we actually concentrate more on the machines and, and parts and the advertising that goes along with it. Now, it was 1877 that Thomas Edison invented the, the phonograph. He was working on the uh, telephone at the time, experimenting with it, when he stumbled across the principle of recording and reproducing sound. He really didn't think much of it and kind of set it off to the side uh, and continued experimenting with the telephone. As we all know, Alexander Graham Bell beat him to the punch on, on that invention. But uh, he did go back to the phonograph, and he foresaw, foresaw it first as just a business machine for taking dictation. The first uh, records were actually wax cylinders. You may have seen these. Some of you are old enough to remember dictaphones. It was, it was the same principle. It was recorded onto a wax cylinder, and the first machines were sold to businesses strictly to take dictation. Well, it was at the 1893 Columbian Exposition when uh, an entrepreneur put up a booth. He was selling the uh, phonographs to businessmen, and he decided to let people record their own voice. Well, some people started singing a song and such, and other people got interested in that. And this entrepreneur had that aha moment that it's music people would like to listen to on this machine. So they started recording music and actually created the industry we know today. Uh, the music industry uh, was led by Thomas Edison with the cylinder phonographs. Well, other people, uh, such as Columbia, came on the scene, Columbia Records and Columbia Phonographs. And it really wasn't until uh, 1895 when e- Emil Berliner and Eldridge Johnson uh, formed the Victor Talking Machine Company, uh, which came out with the flat record or the disc record. This was a, a way to get around Edison's patents of, of the cylinder record. And the flat record format caught on very quickly, not because it was any sounded any better or it was more convenient, but uh, they, uh, Berliner and uh, Johnson recognized very early on that it was the music people wanted, so they would sell the machines cheap, knowing that they would come back and buy records, kind of like when you buy a, uh, a, a printer for your, your computer today. Uh, they sell you the printer cheap because they know you're going to buy all the ink and the paper. Well, it was the same with the early phone, uh, disc phonographs, and one of the genius uh, things that they did was they went out and hired all the best talent they could. 
Uh, Thomas Edison was very cheap and didn't want to pay the artists much money. But uh, uh, J- uh, Johnson and Berliner uh, recognized very early on that if they had the best performers, people would buy their machines and, and buy their records then. So that's what they did. And uh, by 1929, they had drove Thomas Edison out of business. Uh, so when you come out to our, our auction, you're going to see a lot of early machines. You'll see the uh, Edison cylinder machines, uh, a lot of those for sale. Uh, there's going to be the disc phonographs with the horns, and then the later, which evolved into the Victrolas, the upright machines. So you're going to see something, uh, something there for everybody. And I also said we have radios there, too. Uh, radio formats started coming out uh, in the uh, early 1920s. In fact, I think the station is just going to be selling, c- celebrating its 100th anniversary here, AM560, coming up. So it was in the 1920s when radio really uh, started catching on. And uh, it, was, it was a new entertainment format because it was a lot of live broadcasts. You could hear uh, comedians and, and shows and events that you normally uh, people isolated in rural areas would never have uh, any exposure to. So we do have a lot of radios, vintage radios, going back to the 20s, all the way up until the, I think we have uh, items there from the 1980s, actually, too. Uh, most of these radios came out of collections, so they're, they work. Uh, they're, they're beautiful machines. Uh, a lot of them are dictated by design at the time, so you're going to have Art Deco radios, Art, Mo- Art Mo- Modern radios, styling uh, so there's a lot of people that collect actually just for the cabinet styles, too. So if you're looking to put a vintage radio uh, in your home, I mean, this is the place to come because we have um, several hundred radios uh, for sale at, at this auction also. Uh, there's also lots of parts that we, we have in the uh, the auction coming up. Uh, some people need parts for the machine. It might be a crank or they need a reproducer for their machine or, or eat needles. I mean, if you have an old phonograph that needs needles, the steel needles that have to be replaced all the time, uh, you might wonder where to get them, or you can, well, you can get them at, the, at this auction. Um, I also mentioned music boxes, too. The music boxes were a different type of format. They're, they don't play music as such like a record. They're the, the forerunners of your small jewelry music boxes and such that you have in your home today. Uh, they play the Swiss and German uh, music boxes played a cylinder, where most of the American disc, uh, American music boxes played discs, a big flat disc, a steel disc. And as this disc turned, it passed over what looked like a large steel comb, and each tooth of the comb plays a different note on the musical scale. So as this disc turns, there's little perforations that act as fingers to pick out the different notes of the song. Uh, if you've never heard one of these music boxes, they are absolutely beautiful. And it's really a good time to buy right now because there are so many of these coming out on the market as as uh, collectors are passing on or, or they're retiring and they want to put their collections up for sale. So there's a lot of beautiful examples. I mean, we have machines there that haven't been on the market for the last 40 or 50 years. So this is really a, a time to come out. Our auction is go- going to be um, on Wednesday and Thursday starting 10 a.m. both times. It's online. You can see it online now. Everything's online at DonnellyAuctions.com. You can bid online, or you can come out to the auction. We'd love to see you out there and play some of the machines and, and, and talk with you. Preview will be uh, on Tuesday from 10 a.m. Uh, I'm sorry, noon till 7 p.m. on, on Tuesday. And uh, the auction's Wednesday and Thursday, both day. And we'd love to have you out there. You can meet some of the collector, too, because a lot of guys will be coming in, on, in for that. So uh, that's our, our June 12th and uh, 13th auction on July 19th. We have the Lake Forest uh, Ferrari uh, auction coming up. This is really a huge event. Uh, I think Rand- you've heard Randy and Susan talking about this for the past few weeks. It's going to uh, feature a lot of Ferrari, Maserati, and Aston Martin items, race cars from uh, uh, Richard Petty. Uh, it, it is just going to be an unbelievable event. And this is by uh, – Invitation only, so you have to have to apply for because it's limited seating. It's not that we don't want, want everybody to come, but it's going to be held at the dealership, and it's very limited. But it will be online also, so you can bid, bid online on, on the items. Everything's photographed and described very well. And again, go to DonnellyAuctions.com to see that auction. Uh, August seventeenth and eighteenth is our summer classic. Now we usually do a spring classic and a fall classic, which has all of our cars and motorcycles, coin op games, slot machines, gas pumps. But we've had so much merchandise coming in, we cannot hold it all till the fall. So we decided to launch a, uh, a summer classic. Uh, that'll be August 17th and 18th. And if you have any old cars, motorcycles, 
coin-op games, slot machines, gas pumps, uh, gasoline signs and automotive signs, porcelain and neon signs, anything really cool. That's what goes into this auction. Uh, so you can always contact us at DonnellyAuctions.com, or you can call us at 815-923-7000, and that will uh, uh, we'll, we'll set you up. Uh, we do we do offer pickup service too, so if you're wondering how you're going to get that uh, big old jukebox out of your basement, we got a we got some strong young guys with good backs that can help you with that. So uh, give us a call; we'd love to see what you have. Always have room for more, and that's for August 17th and 18th. Well, we'll be right back here. We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking to Neil, our gun expert, and uh, see what he has to say. You're listening to AM560, Donnelly Auctions. See you, uh, see you right back in a minute here. Auctioneers of antiques, collectors of cool, even veterans of vintage, and they can introduce themselves. Thanks for listening. This is the Donnelly Auctions Hour on AM560, The Answer. Welcome back. I'm Mike Donnelly, and you're listening to the Donnelly Auctions Hour here on AM560, The Answer. Uh, joining us now is Neil Leaders, who is our firearms expert at Donnelly Auctions. He handles... Hello. He handles all of our gun uh, gun consignments and is in charge of making sure that all federal and state laws are followed for both us and our consigners. Neil, what's going on, buddy? Thanks for joining us. Oh, not so much. Thank you for having me. What do we got coming up? We got a gun auction uh, coming up here. Soon? We sure do. We've got one coming up July thirteenth. Um, already getting a great start on our inventory, so uh, it's going to be a good one again. And we have military in this one. Is this just guns or is this guns and military, too? Guns and military. Okay. Uh, guns on Saturday, military on Sunday. Yeah, so if you uh, guns, you want to talk to Neil. And uh, if you have military items, uh, contact Randy because he's, he's our military expert in that respect. Uh, you know, Neil, what's happening with our gun laws right now, both federally and on the state level? I hear a lot of, you know, confusion. Well, there's confusion. A, a lot of interesting happenings right now. Um, mind you, I'm not an attorney, but this is my understanding of it. Um, May 16th, SCOTUS agreed to move the Illinois semi-auto gun ban challenges to conference, which means it's going to, they're basically deciding if they're going to hear the arguments or not. Um, One theory of what's happening is they may combine, um, the main challenge for Illinois is the Barnett and Raul challenge, then there's a bunch of other ones. Um, They may combine that with a bunch of other states, like the Bianchi challenge in Maryland right now. And hopefully uh, rule on the constitutionality of these bans all together. They'll lump them all together and rule on them. Um, I think this would be a strong ruling to set precedence. Um, they say that we may even have a ruling by this fall, but who knows? Well, I definitely hope it goes in our favor. I mean, I don't know why they keep yeah. trying to take our rights away when they don't enforce the gun laws they have on the books. It's just amazing Absolutely, to me. absolutely. And, you know, I get asked by a lot of people, too, can I still sell my own gun? I, I know the short answer is yes, but there's a lot more involved. Am I correct? There's a lot more involved. Um, at this point, if you have uh, one of the banned guns, you're already in violation. They had to be uh, registered by January 1st, and if not, Obviously, you're not um, not in the graces of the law right now. Um, so, what do they can do with it? Can they can they bring it in for auction? I mean, what what? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. My recommendation. Well, there's ways of selling it, but it's exposing yourself. Then, um, bringing it to us, I'll give you a receipt for it, saying that you no longer have possession of it. Um, best way to go right now. And then at our auction, they get sold out of state, so it's all done legal exactly. and everything correct. About 75, 80% of our guns go out of state, so um, you know, we're, we can legally transfer them out. So and, You know, and a, and a lot of times uh, we get our collections off of uh, widows whose husbands have recently passed and such, and right. they, they had big gun collections. And, you know, for them, it's, it's kind of a daunting task. And, and if they don't have a FOID card, the, the firearms owner ID card that Illinois requires, what is – What's their legal responsibility? They have a 60 days grace period. Um, they have to have either a FOID card or they have to be rid of them. Um, so you have to sell them 
if you're not going to get the FOID card, the FOID card can take up to 60 days to get. Um, the other thing is these ladies are, you know, what are they worth? Um, they don't know, probably. I don't mean to sound sexist, but um, they probably don't know what they're worth. Well, I think a, a lot of the, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the husband's friends, they're friends of the husband, not the wife. And more times than not, it's a sad thing, but they're almost like vultures coming in. And and we, we see that, we see that happen lately. all the time, yeah. And, you know, it, it's just sad to see them get taken advantage of. With me, the more money I make them, the more money I make. So obviously behooves them to uh, go through us because I'm going to get them the most amount of money I can possibly get. Um, they have the 60 days grace period. If they did want to sell it on their own, they have to write a receipt between the two of them five point description including the serial number the seller's information address void card all that their um information name address void card they have to do a police background check now on even private sales um you know that could be daunting you have to go on the website get do all the procedures to get the background check done and then you have to you have to know all the all the laws on selling a gun what guns you can sell to what age and all that if there's state lines involved, um, that's all factors in there. Going through us, we take care of everything. And we do we, everything by the book. And we caution people, do not sell your guns without taking care of this properly. You know, this happens right. all the time. You know, oh, I'll give you cash for it on the side. You don't have to worry about it. I'll take care of everything. It is not the correct way to go. You are not within compliance of the law. If that gun... Somewhere down the line, uh, gets involved in a crime or something, or is, or is uh, taken by the police, and the serial numbers are checked, and it comes back to you. It's going to come back to the, the the original owner, and if they they'll trace it all the way back. And if you did not dispose of that gun correctly, you are in violation. And boy, they will make an example out of you. Not trying to scare everybody. We're just trying to make you aware of how serious a matter this is. I agree. I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, I do everything by the book. My main concern is protecting our FFL, and so I I follow it by the letter. So you can always feel confident with uh, legalities here. So when when people uh, buy the guns uh, from us, mm-hmm. what what uh, what's the process? If they're bidding online, let's say they're yeah. from Colorado and then and they purchase a, a nice Remington hunting rifle. What happens? Okay, the first thing they get billed and they have to pay for it. Then everything turned over to you from that point on? For the most part. Um, me, as an FFL holder, I have to ship to, an, if it's going out of state, I have to ship to another FFL holder, a gun store. Um, once it gets there, they do the background check, they do all the legal paperwork for the ATF. Um, ATF Form 4473, and all in compliance with them. And they do the full background check and surrender it after whatever their waiting period is. They follow all the state laws there. Um, Here in Illinois, since we're the FFL, we're the ones that do the background check, do the Form 4473, and we comply by Illinois laws. So... Each each state has their own laws, and you have to do it in compliance with them. So once again, by selling through us, we mm-hmm. take care of all the paperwork. As soon as that gun is signed over to our FFL, pe- people are legally out of it. Any responsibility, correct? We're responsible for it. Then. That's correct, yes. And what, what, what do we got coming up as far as uh, what, what have you been taking in lately as far as some interesting firearms? Anything? We've always got some neat guns. Um I got in a couple of martinis. Um, I've got in not, not the a, alcoholic kind. No, not the al- <laughs> alcoholic kind. The old British uh, rifles. The I have a uh, a fantastic. Uh, forgive me. I think it's a 1912 Colt 1911 commercial in absolutely fantastic condition. Um, we've got. We're starting to. They're rolling in right now. Um, we got in. Obviously, airs that we'll have to sell out of state, but we've got. Uh, you know, I, I just saw something yeah. a load of uh, interesting items come in the other day. Pass pass by me on the way to your office. There, yeah. uh, the uh, gentleman who worked for the uh, movie industry uh, yes. for all, all the yeah. all the prop guns. I mean, there are some crazy looking stuff coming in there. 
And there are some neat movie props. Um, they've been using a lot of movies, a lot of TV shows that everybody would recognize that were shot here in Chicago. He supplied the uh, weapons to them, and I've got them here. He's deciding to get out of the business. And, He's retiring uh, there. And I mean, yeah. <laughs> did I, did, 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 did I see some M2 machine guns go by replicas, too? <laughs> yeah. We got some Maduses uh, that run on gas for... Uh, yeah, it's a great prop, and I've got a couple of those. I've got a 1919. I've got uh, tons of handguns, um, and those, rifles. Those, yeah, all kinds of. And those are all going to go in our July props, 13th RPGs auction. and stuff like that. So, and this all going in our July 13th auction, correct? Correct, correct. And, and if the people have things they want to consign, firearms and even ammunition, how do they get a hold of you, Neil? It's real simple, um, 815-923-7000. Just ask for Neil or the gun guy, if you can't remember my name, or gun monkey or whatever you want to call me. And uh, they'll find out who it is, and they'll get it to me, and we'll talk, and we can set out uh, our set up pickups and everything else. So, Well, thanks again, Neil. Uh, maybe when we're done here, we can head over to Garibaldi's and have a pepper and egg sandwich huh, on the way home. That, <laughs> that is a plan, I tell you. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Sure thing. Uh, we'll be right back. My name is Mike Donnelly for the Donnelly Auctions Hour, and you are listening to AM560, The Answer. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Donnelly Auctions Hour on AM 560, The Answer. Welcome back. I'm Mike Donnelly, and you're listening to the Donnelly Auctions Hour here on AM 560. We're with you every Saturday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., uh, bringing you a lot of information on antiques and collectibles. And joining us now is uh, Ryan, Ryan Boyle, who is our coin, precious metals, and sports memorabilia expert here at Donnelly's. Ryan, what's going on today, man? Not much. How are you doing today, Mike? Thanks for having me. Just fine. Just fine. I, you're, you're, the, you're the only guy there that has his own office. Do you realize that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I haven't, but now I do, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pretty important one, too, because you handle all of our, our coins and precious metals and uh, even uh, uh, jewelry and things like that, too. Uh, tell us a little about what's, uh, what's happening with the coins uh, right now. I, I see silver hit like $30 last week, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, it's um, the precious metals are uh, really uh, popping right now. Um, I, I think a week ago, last Sunday of all days, silver went up like a dollar thirty on a Sunday, oh. um, which is pretty large. It's a pretty large bump for silver. Um, it's holding around thirty. So, um, and then gold is around twenty three and a half. So, that's uh, up there too. And so, obviously, any um, you know, any silver or gold coins would increase in value just based off on their melt content. Right. That that affects more the <clears throat> the common coins, uh, yep. scrap silver, as we, as we call it and such like that. But when we're talking about really high-grade coins, uh, I hear the term being slabbed or being graded. Explain to people what that means, actually. Well, um, basically what it is is um, you would send in, if you have a, a nice coin, you would send it in to a um, private uh, company for evaluation. Um, the main one is uh, PCGS, uh, NGC is the number two. Um, and you'd send it off to them, and then they basically have a process where they basically uh, evaluate the item, and then... Um, the benefits are that it basically, you know, they guarantee its authenticity, um, and then they give it a grade. Um, and so its grade would, um, you know, it would determine its value. Um, the benefit of knowing its grade would then you know exactly what you have, whereas if you have what's called a raw coin, which is not graded, you know, I could say it's MS-62, but it could be MS-64. Um, you know, it really doesn't matter what I think until... PCGS or NGC agree with what I think. Oh, and explain uh, that grading. What do they mean by MS? What is, what is that? And where does that grading go from and to? What's the high and the low? Um, it would it, it would go to um, um, well, the high would be a mint state. So mint state would be MS sixty, um, and it would go up to mint state seventy, which would be the um, the highest that you can get. Um, you probably won't, you don't see very many 70s in, um, you know, older coins. You'd see them more in 
um, it, when people get, you know, American Eagles graded and more, more modern coins, um, you're going to see the higher grades. Uh, like Morgan dollars, a high grade would be like a 65, 66, 67. Um, and it would go all the way down to good. Good would be, you know, where, you know, basically you could barely make out the details of the, of the coin. Um, and all in between, there's, you know, different stages where the one before Mint State would be AU, which would be uh, almost uncirculated. Um, so that would mean it just have a couple flaws that would not make it Mint State and, you know, kind of just backpedals from there. And, and so they actually put these in a, a little plastic holder with the grading information right on there, and that's accepted worldwide, correct? Yep, precisely. Um, and that's what they—that's what the term slab means. When when they grade it, they put it in like a—I believe it's an acrylic, uh, what we call slab, but it's like a holder. Um, and basically, so now you have the coin presented, so you can see the front and the back, and it's protected, so there will never be any damage done to it because it's you know, in this slab. And then on there you also have, um, you know, it's, a, it's identified. So it'll say exactly what year, what the coin is, um, the denomination, and then the grade. And then below that there is also a serial number that you can go on to their um, independent, um, you know, website and um, punch it in and basically it would um, pop, populate a, an image of your coin. So that's one way you can also, because they do, um, you know, you have to be careful. They do, you know, fake slabs and such. So that's another safety feature that you're able to, you know, type in that precise serial number and then see the photo of the coin when they grade it. And there, there is a cost associated with having this done. Uh, you can tell us what that is. And, and, and at what point does it make sense to have that done? Because sometimes the value of having it graded outweighs the cost of the coin actually correct oh yeah yeah um and it, it, it varies i mean um there, there's basically um like annex would be another a third uh coin grader and if you do bulk submissions they do it down to i believe like 25 dollars a coin um and it goes up to i want to say around 40 50 dollars so uh, in many cases well worth having that done Yes, yes, exactly. Um, you know, it, it, you it, you would want to do it if you have a rare date coin to identify what you hit. Okay, we're up against the clock here. Can you hold on for one more segment? Because I really want to get to the uh, sports memorabilia point. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. All right, I'm Mike Donnelly here for the Donnelly Auctions Hour here on AM560. You will, We will be back in just a minute, so stay tuned. And now, more of the Donnelly Auctions Hour on AM560, The Answer. Welcome back. I'm Mike Donnelly. You're listening to the Donnelly Auctions Hour here on AM560. And we're here with Ryan Boyle, who is our coin, precious metals, and sports memorabilia expert. We're just talking about coins, but I I really want to move on to the sports memorabilia uh, because you've been getting in some crazy stuff I've been seeing uh, uh, in your section up there as far as sports memorabilia. Uh, Tell us what are the stuff we got coming up. I have, uh, yeah, I have a nice little array uh, going, um, and I do have a couple um, um, possibilities on the horizon. I was just um, um, over at someone's house, and we may have a uh, Lou Gehrig ball that's uh, certified coming in, so that'd be a, a really nice uh, piece. Um, other than that, I have a lot of uh, autographed uh, uh uh, MVP uh, baseball bats. Um, I have several Jordan autographed uh, uh, basketballs, and I have a Neiman, um, Leroy Neiman autographed uh, Michael Jordan. Um, I have quite a few uh, Jordan pieces um, of a lot of uh, baseball cards, too. I have a lot of uh, 50s, 60s baseball cards, a lot of stuff that's uh, slab and graded. Uh, a lot that's not, but uh, still really good stuff. Um, it should be a really good and entertaining auction. Uh, I heard you sneak in there again, slabbed and graded. So even sports mem- memorabilia is slabbed and graded also, correct? Uh, well, it's graded. It, it, it depends uh, on the item. Um, they slab yeah, mo- uh, mainly the cards is what they put yeah. in slabs, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the cards would be what would be slab, but like, 
uh, the painting that I'm referring to, uh, they would uh, most likely they would put a like a, a hologram sticker on it, and there would be a uh, letter of uh, authenticity that would be attached to it. And same thing with like a basketball or or a, a baseball bat or something like that. Yeah, yeah. They they normally put like a hologram um, uh, logo um, with a with a number on there that uh, ties it to a COA. You know, I, I see uh, a lot of guys when they bring stuff in, when they've had something autographed, uh, especially the modern day stuff, they have their picture with the the celebrity, the sports celebrity, actually autographing it. Does that help a lot when they have the picture of them with the the person? It, 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 it helps. Um, you know, it, it just added. Um, you know, it's an added plus. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, as with all these grading companies, whether it be you know, coins or sports, there's normally, a, you know, a handful that are pretty widely accepted. And then you have a, a lot that kind of try to, um, you know, take advantage of the situation. Um, so as long as it's graded by one of the, you know, the primary uh, graders, um, you know, it's pretty well accepted. But having the photo, you know, certainly, you know, it's hard to argue that then. Okay. And going back to cards, I mean, a, a lot of people have their card collections and if they're not in absolute mint state, uh, unless it's somebody really, really sought after, the condition hurts it a lot, right, if they're not particularly mint in, in the modern cards. Precisely, precisely. In the modern cards, I mean, honestly, unless it's, you know, with a couple of exceptions, um, you know, if it's not going to be really, if it's not going to grade an eight, uh, you're, you're probably doing it. Um, just for the the sport, uh, you're you're not at that point. If you're not going to get an eighth or a better, you're probably going to have more money tied up into grading it than um, what the card would ever be worth. Um, if you had in like a nine five, then possibly sometimes you have a you know, you know, you get like another fifty or a hundred bucks something like that with modern cards. Um, and, and it's got to be somebody special to even have graded. I mean, you just don't have every card graded in in, in modern cards. It's not worth doing, correct? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't. Um, you know, so a lot of people, you know, grade cards just because they, they like a particular player or, you know, they have some sort of, um, you know, attachment to it. But, um, you know, me personally, if it's not a, you know, like a, a, a rookie or a prospect, or a you know Hall of Famer, or a MVP, or something like that. Then um, you know I normally just advise not to. And what would you uh, uh, advise people to invest in as far as sports memorabilia? What what for long term? What would you what would you recommend? Um, well, I per, I, I personally like the the older stuff. Um, I I like the the Lou Gehrig stuff, the Ty Cobb stuff, the Ted Williams. Um, uh, to me, that stuff will always have an appreciation, and it should always, um, you know, maintain and raise in value. Um, certainly, Michael Jordan's not going anywhere. Um, Kobe Bryant, um, you know, uh, everyone loves him. Um, and and even uh, LeBron James, he's got a lot of stuff out there, but um, you know, he's he does have a lot of records and. Um, you know, possibly hanging on to some of his stuff, I think, could possibly uh, hop in there. Okay, and so a lot of that stuff is for people with deeper pockets, too. If you're, if you're a young kid starting out, say in your, your, your te- late teens, early 20s, what would you buy that you could afford? Um, you know, I, I, would, I would focus in on prospects because if, if you could get a prospect and he performs well, then... Um, you know, you can make a, a substantial amount of money and fairly quickly. Um, but, you know, you'd have to follow, you know, you have to, then you have to really follow baseball and know who's really has the, the possibility of popping. Um, if not, certainly, you know, I'll tell you, um, even pulling um, packs now, they, they have some really cool stuff that they put in there, um, you know, relic autograph cards where they have a player's autograph with, a, you know, a cut up piece of their jersey attached to the card. Um, it, which is really, really neat. And then a lot of low pop stuff that, you know, they only made like 50 of. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Ryan. And uh, if you have sports memorabilia or coins, give us a call at 815-923-7000 or send it to DonleyAuctions.com. Yeah, send your photos and we'll see what you have and uh, 
let you know what, what we think you can get out of it. We'll be right back. You're listening to the uh, Donnelly Auctions Hour. The Donnelly Auctions Hour continues now on AM560, The Answer. I'm Mike Donnelly. You're listening to the Donnelly Auction Hour here on AM560. We're with you every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, last segment, we talked about uh, sports memorabilia and coins and such with uh, Ryan. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point is uh, talk a little bit about the auction process. I know to a lot of people, there's some big mystery as to exactly what we do and uh, why we charge what we have to charge. We have to charge you a commission uh, based basically on the, the value of your item. And that's how uh, we make our money and, and cover our costs. And uh, just like to go over, you know, what happens there. You know, from the time you contact us, whether it be through uh, email or a phone call, uh, uh, you start talking with one of our girls and uh, generally they request photos. Uh, either emailed or mailed in, either way, however you want to do it. Then it's passed on to either one of our experts or Randy and I. Usually it comes to Randy and I first, and then we uh, disseminate it to who we think it should go to. Uh, although we handle probably hmm, 75 or 80 percent of the initial calls ourselves, we'll generally follow up uh, your email with a phone call and we'll talk with you. Uh, if we feel that you have something that uh, we can sell for you, uh, then what we'll do is we'll make an appointment. We'll come out and take a look at the items and go from there. We have to discuss the value of it, what your realization or what you hope to get out of the item. Because sometimes uh, expectations are a little unrealistic, especially in today's market. Some of the items have dropped in value. But uh, nonetheless, most times people uh, generally have to get rid of this these items through uh, uh, a death in the family or maybe you just retirement and uh, you want to move away and downsize your collections. So once we uh, re- reach an agreement on the uh, the value of it, we sign a contract. We schedule a pickup. Uh, either my brother and I will be on site during the pickup or we s- we'll send our crew out who is very versed in, in handling antiques and they're, they're very good with that. Uh, the items come back to the auction house. They're tagged. They're inventoried. Then they go to photography. And depending on the items, sometimes it's uh, being photography for a half hour, 45 minutes or more, uh, getting different angles, different shots, insides, outsides, depending on what the item is. Uh, from there, then it gets put back on, on the shelves or in, or in a waiting area for description. Then the item has to be described. Uh, sometimes that will take... Uh, I've just taken things that have taken me over an hour to describe because I have to research it a little bit uh, because what we want to always do is get the best value we can for you. The only way we make money is to make you money. So uh, we actually become partners in in, in the item. So I'll, Randy and I will fight for every dollar we can for, for your item because that's how we make our money. Uh, after the auction uh, or, or after it's described, then it gets uploaded to the computer in one of our auctions. Uh, the day of the auction, we have auctioneers in there. We have a lot of people in there that that uh, run the computers for because we're online on on three different online auction platforms. Uh, after the auction, everything goes to shipping, and that's a process in itself. We have four people in our shipping department. That's all they do is ship packages all day long. So you can imagine after an auction, there'll be. A thousand items that have to be shipped out, and everybody wants theirs first. Well, you can only do so many packages a day. I mean, if they do a hundred packages a day, which is a huge amount, that's only ten. Uh, uh, that's ten days before we can even ship your item. So that's pretty much how it happens. Uh, boy, I can't believe it. That, that just about wraps it up for another show. Uh, can't believe how fast the hour flies by. Uh, remember to tune in every Saturday from one to two p.m right here on AM 560 for another episode of the Donnelly Auctions Hour. And on behalf of Randy, Susan, and the entire staff at Donnelly Auctions, I'm Mike Donnelly, and we'll see you at the auction. Thanks for listening to the Donnelly Auctions Hour on AM 560, The Answer. Check out all the latest information on upcoming auctions and collectibles at DonnellyAuctions.com. And while you're there, you can contact someone about buying or selling your collectibles or estates. That's DonnellyAuctions.com.